I bet you if I asked a Spaniard what and when was the first Spanish kingdom, they'd be able to answer my question quite easily. The options are fairly straightforward. The same would apply to the French and the English. Now let me clarify, and just to avoid confusion, when I say first kingdom, I'm inquiring about any type of single large geographic and highly populated domain or power under the rule of a single authority that had its 15 minutes of fame at some point in the history books. It could be a kingdom, principality, or an empire. It really doesn't matter, as long as it was the first. So for the Spanish, it would be the kingdom of Castile and Aragon during the 15th century. With the English, the kingdom of England of the 10th century would fulfill that question. But if I were to ask an Arab the same question, what and when was the first Arab kingdom or power? I'm sure I'd get a thousand variations for an answer. Do we really know? Is there a defined political slash geographic Arab entity, a kingdom, realm, or any other variant that we can clearly define as being the first? The answer to all those questions would be a no. We can't say with full confidence which Arab kingdom came first. You see, to be able to unreservedly identify a single kingdom or civilization is not so cut and dry. To do that, we have to, in consensus, define what makes an Arab kingdom an Arab kingdom. And that starts with the word Arab or Arabic. Is it all derived from a belonging to a specific geographic location, as in Arabia, in its most expanded of versions? Or is it how some reference books identify Arab as an ethnicity? Or could it purely be a language-based precondition that drives the belonging of a certain civilization or kingdom to Arabs? It's neither the geography nor the ethnicity that defines an Arab kingdom. The problem with geography is that as much as it is totally objective, it's also extremely malleable. Arabia at its most basic level was strictly identified as the landmass of the Arabian Peninsula. On the next level, the realm would include the Fertile Crescent while also incorporating the Levant. And at its grandest, the Arab geographic boundaries would include northeastern Africa incorporating the African Horn. And within each variation, a resultant list of potentially historical candidates could qualify as Arab kingdoms. Now, that would be a whole lot of kingdoms and empires to list in one go, and would mean that civilizations such as ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Phoenician, and Canaanite, and so on, were all Arab. Seems overambitious. The same exact thing applies to ancestral ethnicity. Arabia was an epicenter of early human genealogy and consequently, such a factor in identifying the earliest Arab kingdom would lead to many civilizations again deemed Arab. An identical filter to that of the geographic filter, and possibly even beyond. But one that also fails. And hence, we're left with the one and only true factor that can identify the potential first Arab kingdom or empire, and that's language, though Arabic as the defining element. And if we seek back in time to where most believe Arab history, to have all started, then we arrive at the Rashidun Caliphate in the early 7th century, when all three variables applied. Geography, ethnicity, and language. Easy, right? But that is an inaccurate version of history, because if we use language as a precursor to name a kingdom or empire as Arab, then we must ask a different question. When is considered the first iteration of Arabic as a language? And on that basis, we may then define the first Arab kingdom or power. In order for us to go back through the history of the Arabic language, we have to clarify three misunderstandings. The first is that Arabic didn't start with Islam. Arabic existed many centuries prior to the revelations of the faith. Another misunderstanding to highlight is that in researching the first iterations of Arabic, we have to do so without the inclusion of any writing system. For Arabic, there were several writing systems, most of which are extinct now. We're focusing strictly on spoken Arabic. And once we liberate the spoken from the written, a whole new range of possibilities present themselves. The final misunderstanding is that for Arabic, as with many languages across antiquity, the versions that were spoken back then were far different to the language we know as Arabic today. The same way in which Old Spanish and English differ from that of modernity. Upon making these clarifications, and when we rewind history to reveal how Arabic went through its various progressions, Classical Arabic from our modern era to the 10th century, preceded by Quranic Arabic in the 10th century to the 7th century, Old Hijazi Arabic from the 7th century to the 1st century, Nabataean Arabic 
from the 1st century to the 4th century BCE, and finally, Old Arabic from the 4th century BCE to the end of the first millennium. And even beyond this review of history, Proto-Arabic preceded Old Arabic, yet today remains fairly undiscovered and consequentially understudied. One side note to clarify here is that the term Arab or Arabic when speaking about languages in antiquity doesn't necessarily equate to past spoken versions of the Arabic language, but in fact include non-Arab languages that existed in what was historically the Arabian Peninsula. I know, a little confusing perhaps, but necessary to explain that a lot of languages labeled within the families of Old Arabic or Proto-Arabic were indeed not related to Arabic at all. Now that we have assessed and established an Arabic language timeline, we can now cross-reference the language progression eras with historical known power centers. And if we use the datum point of the Rashidun Caliphate power as the beginning and start our backtracking in history, in search of Arab-speaking powers, we arrive at al manadara or the Lahmid Kingdom in the eastern provinces of the Arabian Peninsula, which in parallel saw another power, the Ghassaniyya or the Ghassanid Kingdom from the 7th century till the early 3rd century in the northwest region of the peninsula, followed by the Nabataean Kingdom from the 1st century to the 3rd century BCE. And finally, we arrive at the Kingdom of Thamud that existed from the 3rd century BCE to the 8th century BCE. The Kingdom of Thamud was a tribal confederation located in the northwestern region of the Arabian Peninsula. A single tribal leader held authority over the group of Arab tribes. The Mudians were merchants dealing with the trade of goods along the Red Sea shores and who interacted mainly with the Neo-Assyrian Empire in the Levant. The Kingdom of Thamud was mentioned 23 times in the Quran, identifying the people as a sinful community were eventually destroyed by Allah because of their polytheistic beliefs and due to their rejection of the Prophet Saleh, whom Allah had sent to warn them of an impending doom should they not repent. But why do we stop at the Kingdom of Thamud? Because that's the last power that has been referenced as Arab, be it within stone inscriptions or in historical records of antiquity. We see the first instance of this record at Bayir Jordan, the northern tip of what was the Kingdom of Thamud with an inscription in Old Arabic containing a prayer to the gods of the Iron Age kingdoms of Ammon, Moab, and Edom, Malcolm, Kamosh, and Kaos, respectively. O Malcolm, Kemosh, and Kaos, we place under your protection these wells against ruin. Another piece of key evidence in confirming that the Thamuds were known as Arabs back in antiquity is a letter by the last king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, Namonidus, in the 6th century BCE. In this document, the king instructs his treasury to make payment to a Tamuda Araba, Tamud al-Arabi, as this was apparently a merchant trading with the empire. In the 5th century BCE, Herodotus, the father of Western history, recalls in his founding work, The Histories, Book 1, Chapter 131, they learned later to sacrifice to the heavenly Aphrodite from the Assyrians and Arabians. She is called by the Assyrians Milita, by the Arabians, Alilat, by the Persians, Mitra. Alilat, or Alat, being the same goddess whose temple was destroyed by the Prophet Muhammad a millennium later. Further Western evidence from classical sources confirm the same, that Thamud was an Arabian kingdom, such as with Agathar Chilis in his On the Erythrean Sea. Diodorus, in his recounts of the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea in this case, and also with Ptolemy, who recounted the geographic borders of the kingdom. All these accounts, though important, were centuries beyond the existence of the kingdom of Thamud. By then, the Nabataeans had taken over as the regional Arab power. So, yes, we can safely say that the first Arab kingdom it is for the Thamuds. But that is only up until we discover new evidence and empirical proof that pushes the first Arab kingdom further back into antiquity. The Arabian Peninsula is still raw with uncovered gems waiting to be unearthed, revealing a new and more complex history than the one we currently accept as real. And with each passing year, what history has been fed to us in modernity seems to disappear and transform into a reality that is much more aligned with the facts in the ground.